Bond films have a reputation for being bombastic, loud, and audacious, and nothing roars that mission statement clearer than the film's pre-title sequences. Since the second Bond film in 1963, each 007 adventure has begun with such a sequence, more often than not sandwiched in between the gun barrel and the opening credits, and they allow the filmmakers to dazzle the audience with sensational action, get them hooked on a bit of intriguing plot, and or, in some rare cases, try for some early emotional investment. Either way, these sequences are not something that anyone wants to miss, whether a relatively disconnected from the main plot bit of action, like Goldfinger and Octopussy, or something that throws you right into the plot, like Skyfall or Goldeneye. If you were already showing up late for a screening of No Time to Die and the queue for the popcorn was just a little bit too long, I pity the person next to you who had to get you up to speed. Woo! Well, sorry that I'm a little bit late. Uh, what did I miss? Well, do you remember Vespa? No, what's that? Oh boy. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to a ranking of every James Bond pre-title sequence to date. As ever, this video is purely reflective of my own personal tastes, and if you would like to let me know your own thoughts on these sequences, your own rankings even, then do please let me know in the comments section below. And specifically to fans of Live and Let Die, I want to say, please don't hate me too much. Being as big a Live and Let Die fan as I am, I feel bad having this one so low, and I know a lot of people do really like it, and it does have a nice, uniquely creepy vibe to it, as we see a bunch of blokes being bumped off one by one, laying the foundations of the plot that will get Bond involved in the main story. However, the main issue with the sequence, as far as I'm concerned, is that here we have a James Bond pre-title sequence, without James Bond himself actually in it. Okay, not counting the gun barrel, which of course opens the film, this is the only pre-titles without even an image or likeness of James Bond present, which feels so weird, especially as this was of course the film that introduced Roger Moore's version of James Bond to the world. You'd think that they'd want to show off the hero right away, but no, let's see some randoms getting massacred in some kind of bizarre murder montage instead. I think the sequence does well to set up some intrigue, like, yes, I do want to know more about what this is all about, but it's obviously lacking the action that you'd expect and want from one of these things, as well as the leading man himself, so there was really no other candidate for the very bottom spot of this list, I'm afraid. I have a few similar sentiments about the sequence from You Only Live Twice too. It provides the audience with some intriguing setup. A spaceship being hijacked mid-orbit is cool, if slow, and hey, this one gets points for actually including Bond himself. He just doesn't stand up and is seemingly slain before our very eyes. Some of the early pre-titles in particular love to do the whole Bond is dead in the opening few minutes thing, and I think it works better in some instances than others. Here it's just a little disappointing because there's no action as such. There's just a flurry of machine gun fire, but that's it. And like I say, Bond is bedbound for the whole thing. It's common knowledge that Connery was in something of a foul mood during the production of You and Live Twice, but I, did he have it in his contract that half of his scenes had to be filmed with him either sitting or lying down? <laughs> I'll talk more about this later because I do think that there is a perfect formula for Bond pre-titles that includes plot, intrigue, and kick-ass action, and in Yun Live Twice you can see that they're kind of almost there with it. Director Lewis Gilbert will have much more success with his following two Bond adventures, but his first here is one that I've always thought to be a bit of a dud. Yeah, if you can't tell, there's a bit of a running theme with these lowest entries, and it's a lack of Bond himself. And sure enough, similar to Live and Let Die, this is also a pre-title sequence lacking the presence of the man himself. I mean, well, yes, there is a waxwork figure of 007 present, and Roger Moore allegedly cameos as the gunslinger animatronic as well, but the character James Bond himself, aside from the gun barrel sequence, is not in this pre-title sequence. Rather, this serves to introduce the film's main villain, Francisco Scaramanga, of course played by Christopher Lee, and from that perspective I think the sequence is like, good enough. I mean, it sets him up as a brilliant assassin, we see a bit of his daily routine, of swimming, eating oysters, drying his triple nipples and bellowing for his favourite condiment. Take back Tabasco! To this day, I can barely look at a bottle of the thing without hearing Christopher Lee's voice bellowing in my head. And it's like it creates an involuntary reaction within my own body to replicate that same delivery every time I'm asking for that particular condiment, and as a result, I'm banned from 12 restaurants in the Greater London area. So while I think the scene does well with what it sets out to do, it's certainly not up there with the best of the Bond pre-title sequences for me, and that's just kind of by design. It's not trying to be a high-octane mini-Bond adventure. I mean, the biggest stunt in the thing is Christopher Lee sliding down a ramp, for Christ's sake. So as much as I love Scaramanga, this is still going to be a fairly low-ranking sequence in the series. And once again, we have a pre-title sequence without the character of James Bond present at all outside of the gun barrel. I mean, well, I mean, obviously, yes, that is the actor Sean Connery's 
stalking around the hedge maze, but the twist at the end of this sequence is, of course, that it was actually a moustache sporting Spectre agent wearing a Sean Connery mask available at the Spectre Training Island gift shop so that villainous assassin Red Grant can authentically practice his garo killing. I'd love to know the conversations that were had before they set out on this training thing. Like, the guy wearing the Bond mask just must have known that that was not a good sign. Like, he was not going to be cashing in on Spectre's pension scheme at any point. Did, um, anyone else get given one of these? Bit weird, did it? So, I do think that the sequence is nice and suspenseful, and it sets up Grant as a formidable foe. I think it maybe relies a little too much on the whole, you know, they killed Bond in the opening scene gimmick. But this was the film that started that, so, I mean, hey, they were still figuring out the format, and indeed, I think that the next film in the series takes the premise of the pre-title sequence to the next level, but we'll have a few more to talk about before we get to Goldfinger. For a sequence that culminates with the demise of the man who was, well, partly responsible, at least, for murdering James Bond's wife at the very end end of the very last film, you'd think it'd be a bit more epic in scope, but Diamonds Are Forever's pre-titles reintroduces an audience to Sean Connery as James Bond, and I love all the bits where you don't even see him properly, you just see fists and finely polished shoes beating the crap out of a couple of guys before the sequence eventually settles at a retreat of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, played here of course by the incomparable Charles It's just a jump to the left, Grey. It's a shame that there isn't a more exciting fight sequence than the one we get, it's pretty small scale with just a couple of goons and then Blofeld himself, or rather, one of Blofeld's doubles, and this moment has always kind of annoyed me where the actor just freezes in place, like it's just so unnatural and clunky. I think it's an okay sequence, and despite Blofeld's reappearance in the story later on, they clearly wanted to wrap up the fallout of On Her Majesty's Secret Service as quickly and yet also as dubiously as they could, and as such, it all ends up just feeling a bit rushed and vague. As an opening to Diamonds Are Forever, I think it makes for a nice little scene as a follow-on from On Her Majesty's Secret Service, though. It's about as it's about as disappointing as red wine with fish. What the f is that? On a similar note of lackluster, we come to A View to a Kill. This is a perfectly fine action sequence, don't get me wrong, and skiing bits and Bond are always slick and incredibly well produced, and this is no different, but uh, I don't know if the action here ever really moves the dial that much for me personally. The showcase stunt of the sequence is obviously the snowboarding bit, and yeah, it looks awesome, but it's kind of ruined by a Beach Boys cover that plays over it before awkwardly transitioning back into the score. I don't know, am I being too harsh on this one? I guess it comes down to the fact that I just can't get too too excited about any aspect of it, it's okay. It does what a Bond pre-title sequence should do, but I guess it just does it in a relatively mediocre way. And I share those same sentiments with the sequence from Spectre too. Now, I know that a lot of fans really love this one, and again, there's stuff in here that I like an awful lot, just nothing that I feel uh, gets me too excited, uh, except for this moment with Bond nonchalantly strolling along this ledge on his way to work. That moment is just pure brilliance, but the rest of the scene, eh, I mean, the helicopter sequence is supposed to be the standout stunt, but I don't know what it is, if it's the green screen stuff, or, or maybe it's the yellowy sepia filter that's all over Spectre, but something kind of takes me out of the action every time I see this, and I don't know why, because like, they had proper stunt people doing this stuff for real, but the whole bit has such a, such a weird, like, artificial look and feel to it that I find it hard to be wowed, because unlike in other Bond pre-titles, where I'm just marvelling at the magnificence of the stuntery, here it all just feels too disconnected from reality in a way. I mean, now obviously if they'd have done the correct thing and played a slide whistle over the corkscrew stunt, it'd have been very top of this list, but oh well. <laughs> Regular viewers of this channel will of course know that I'm not the biggest of Quantum of Solace fans. That's putting it mildly 007. But I do have something of a soft spot for the pre-title sequence. There's a real blistering jolt of an action scene to kick off the movie. David Arnold's brilliant scoring brings a lot to the table, but there's also just a nice visceralness to some of the crashes too. I think that the sound during this sequence is just really lovely. The thing holding it back from being higher on this list for me personally is that I do feel that it's lacking a bit of Bond-specific flavour, I guess. It's a cool car chase for sure, but there isn't really any show-stopping stunt or gadgetry going on, which is normally a staple for big Bond car chase scenes. 
I just feel like you could transplant in any contemporary action hero into Bond's place and it'd play pretty much the same. I guess it just doesn't feel specific to the 007 universe. I feel like every sequence that we're going to be talking about next contains something that makes it so quintessentially Bond. But this one, eh, it, it's a cool bit of action on a sensory level, but I just wish that it had a bit more Bondian personality to it. Like a jetpack, for instance. Yes, I dare say one of the more iconic Bond gadgets got its showcase in the pre-titles of Thunderball, a sequence that very much creates its own mini-adventure, and to good effect, I'd say. The gun barrel iris opens on a coffin with the initials JB on it in one of the series' more subtle Bond is dead in the opening scene gimmicks, and then moves on to Bond doing battle with a man in drag in a pretty brutal fight sequence. I do love how it's actually prolific Bond stuntman Bob Simmons cameoing here as the baddie, and the sequence obviously climaxes with Bond donning the jetpack and flying to the safety of the Aston Martin DB5. I think this is a really fun sequence and it has everything you would want from a pre-title mini-adventure. There's intrigue, Bond is using his wits, there's a good bit of action, there's a show-stopping stunt, so if it has all of these desirable elements, then why isn't it a bit higher on this list? The problems that I have with it are just the issues that I have with Thunderball broadly anyway, like some of the special effects and the editing is just a, a bit clunky. I mean, this world's the fourth Bond film that they made in as many years, so I think it's only understandable that there'd be a bit of a tired quality to some aspects of the filmmaking, and hey, I'm nitpicking here, but if this just had a wee bit more polish to it, I think it would have been much higher up this list. On Her Majesty's Secret Service was the first film in the series to use its pre-title sequence to introduce an audience to a brand new actor playing James Bond, and wow, did they make the most of this build-up. Love all the stuff here with Lazenby in the shadows, driving his Aston Martin around at dusk, lighting a cigarette, it's all so cool. Diana Riggs Tracy and her attempt at suicide give the sequence a dreamlike feel, something about her in this long flowing dress and Bond in shadows, the music, the jump cuts, there's an ethereal quality to the sequence, making it stand out as something quite unique, I think, even when it treads into more familiar Bond territory of a, a bit of fighting. I think, for what I may have just complained about Thunderball 4, I think that the jump cut editing style works really well in On Her Majesty's Secret Service and gives this fight in particular a bit of extra oomph, technical term there. As an introduction to a new Bond, as well as the film, it's a fine sequence, and the ending where Bond breaks the fourth wall is... This never happened to the other fella. Insert your preferred emotional reaction here. But overall, this one has such a cool, unique vibe to it that I really like, even if it is lacking a signature Bond stunt, perhaps. But hey, for a sequence that starts with a lecture on lint, it's a damn sight better than it has any right to be. Miniaturization. For instance, radioactive lint. What the hell do I pay you for? But stunt work is certainly something not missing from Pierce Brosnan's final Bond film, Dine of the Day, which, true to the film's reputation, takes the stance that... But unless it's more than just think how much more and more will be. And throws a whole load of fire explosions, crashing, surfing, and diamonds in our faces. And that last one, quite literally, a character actually gets diamonds embedded in their face during this scene. Dine of the Day is a much dogged-on film in the Bond canon, and perhaps deservedly so, but when it comes to high-octane action, I think it's... It excels, and I think that its action-first impulses serve its pre-title sequence very well. The surfing that begins the sequence is incredible, even if it is as close as Brosnan's Bond gets to Roger Moore of You to a Kill Stuntman Disconnect Syndrome. Like, sure, I don't expect Pierce Brosnan to learn to surf and then proceed to take on one of the most dangerous surfing spots in the world, but when he walks onto that backlot beach and whips off the mask, there's no way that I can suspend my disbelief to think that this is the same character that just did that, for Christ's sake. Anyway, things really excel when it gets to the hovercraft chase sequence, which is just all kinds of fun, brilliant David Arnold music, lots of phenomenal stunt work and effects going on. It's just a blast, and the audible audience groan from my experiences of seeing this film in the cinema during the first run. This one-liner will stay with me forever. Saved by the bell. <laughs> Despite being known as a more down-to-earth Bond adventure than the preceding Roger Moore entries, For Your Eyes Only certainly didn't give the pre-title action a downgrade, with a super thrilling helicopter sequence and, technically speaking, a final confrontation with Blofeld until the Craig era rebooted the character. All the helicopter stuff is really phenomenal, and perhaps it's unfair of me to do this and compare it to similar helicopter stunts in Spectre, but just while we're on the subject here, it just feels and looks so much more real. Like, obviously miniatures and models are being utilized for some shots, but the whole whole thing comes together so nicely to make for a really tense sequence. As a final bow on Blofeld's involvement in the initial run of films, it's perhaps slightly disappointing, especially as the film deliberately reminds the audience of Bond's incredibly personal history with the baddie, but it still does give us one of the most memorable lines in the entire series, so it can't be all bad, can it? I defy you with delicate 
License to Kills pre-titles lets you know right from the off that we are not in Roger Moore campland anymore, with some pretty brutal violence introducing us to the film's main villain, Franz Sanchez, in a really effective scene followed by Bond and Felix Leiter going on a little mini-mission together, and given how rare Felix actually gets out into the field in these films and, you know, really involved in the action, it's an awful lot of fun seeing the two characters actually caught up in a really high-stakes situation like this, and still making it to the church in time for Felix's nuptials. It's weird to think that other than Pam Bouvier, pretty much all the major characters are introduced in this bit. I mean, Bond, Sanchez, Felix, Lupe, Dario. It's a sequence very much connected to the main plot of the film as well, and indeed, after the credits play, it's the same day. Most of these pre-titles play out a, a little bit of time before the main body of the plot, usually a few days, but in some cases, years. So it's interesting to see one that just kind of rolls along. The showcase stunt is, of course, when Bond and Felix go fishing for Sanchez's escape plane, and it's a really cool bit. The stunt work is terrific and the shots of Dalton on the winch are blended in perfectly. It's a stunt that you don't often see talked about, unlike the likes of GoldenEye's Bungie Jump or Moonraker's Freefall, and maybe it is less audacious than those, but it's still a phenomenal bit of craftsmanship and a really great climax to the sequence. The longest and most narratively ambitious pre-title sequence in all of Bond, No Time to Die, has a lot packed into its over 20 minutes running time, so much so that by the time it gets to the end of it and segues into the titles themselves, they may actually catch you off guard. Along with setting up the main villain of the story, the sequence also seeks to put a cap on Bond's lingering emotions regarding Vesper and re-establish his love of Madeline Swan, and then immediately break them up, while also providing us with the usual jaw-dropping stunts and high-octane action that we expect from the series. So it's a fairly packed program, and it's in all honesty, I think that some of the elements can feel a little bit rushed as a result. Not only does this sequence need to set things up for the rest of the film, it also needs to wrap up some lingering elements from Spectre, so it's a tall order right from the inception. Though I will forever give the sequence props for making me feel the love and connection between Bond and Madeline in the space of two minutes when Spectre couldn't do that with, what, over an hour's worth of screen time with the two together? The sequence gets my vote for being the most scary pre-titles in the series history. Sorry, Live and Let Die, with the first five minutes dedicated to Safin doing his best, well, Michael Myers with an automatic routine, stalking young Madeline around her family home. This could well have just been the whole pre-title sequence in its entirety, but no, it jumps forward in time and keeps going because we need to have that action and that stunt work. The action that does follow, though, is brilliant, and it's great to see the classic Aston Martin DB5 in a fully blown combat role like this again, but if I did have to ding this sequence on just one thing, it would be that there's so much plot and story going on that the action feels a little stop and start in places. Don't get me wrong, I love this sequence, I think it's brilliant, but I think some of the ones that we're going to be talking about coming up have much better pacing. No Time to Die is obviously focused more on the emotion. Uh, the climax to the sequence is not a brilliant stunt, unless you call Bond and Madeline getting away with not shutting down the entire station by trespassing over the tracks a stunt, but rather, the climax is the pair breaking up, giving us probably the most somber pre-credit ending since you only live twice. So, I know that I've set a great deal of stall so far about exhilarating action and standout stunts in these pre-titles sequences, so I can appreciate that it might seem somewhat jarring that I'm placing Casino Royale in the top 10 here, given the relatively subdued scale of the thing, but um, I guess maybe it's just the exception that proves the rule. It of course plays out in stylish black and white as we see Craig's Bond achieving his double O status by performing two kills. One is a considerably smooth affair, while the other is gritty and messy and requires a good deal of effort on Bond's part. There's no big stunt here, it's all relatively contained to an office in a public lavatory, and yet it's still manages to be one of the most exhilarating openings to any of the films, and the build-up to the gun barrel and the title song kicking in is just superb. It works as both an introduction to Craig's Bond, as well as the stylistic difference that Casino Royale has when compared with the previous 20 films in the series. Casino Royale makes a clean break from previous continuity, and I think the pre-title sequence is fairly instrumental in establishing that immediately for an audience's benefit. Anyone still haunted by the sight of Bond windsurfing a tsunami in Die Another Day was hopefully truly satiated by this opening that this film would be something very different. Another Bond introductory pre-title here, the one which of course introduced Timothy Dalton's 007 to the world, and I'll never quite get over just how cool the like the very first clear view of the actors' faces during the sequence. This shot is just all kinds of wonderful, absolutely love it. It sees Bond on a training mission with some fellow operatives that is hijacked and Bond must spring into action to save the day. The thing is certainly elevated by the noticeable participation of Timothy Dalton himself in the stunt work, breathing some much needed believability into Bond action after a view to a kill where Roger 
Dremore barely takes two steps forward without it cutting to a stunt double. And I say that in good humour, you know that I love you, Rog. The action throughout is really cool, and it ends with both a sexy and funny coda when Dalton lands on the yacht of some oblivious rich lady. I think that the sequence sets something of a bar for how to introduce a new Bond to an audience. For all of my praise of the Casino Royale sequence, I am still a sucker for a scene that introduces a new Bond with a bit more action scale. Which leads us into... Another sequence tasked with introducing a new Bond to the world. This one upside down, grinning like a Cheshire cat in a public washroom, interrupting a guy going number two. One of the more bold choices that GoldenEye makes, I think. I wonder if Pierce was like looking back <laughs> like other Bond introductory scenes, like Connery in the casino and Dalton in that action sequence, and <laughs> wondering like, am I getting the short shrift here? Fortunately for him, this sequence features many a shot of the man looking so damn cool, sneaking around a Russian chemical facility on a mission with Sean Bean's 006, giving us something that we'd previously never seen before in the series. 007 teaming up with another 00 agent and out in the field together. The camaraderie between the two provides some nice moments of wry humour, much needed as things do get quite serious when Bond's friend apparently gets his brains blown out in the opening scene. There are some great tense moments and the action is an awful lot of fun as Bond races to get to the plane in time to make an escape. Most of the time you'd be satisfied with just one standout stunt in one of these sequences, but here we're treated to two. The bungee jump that immediately opens the film is breathtaking and a real marvel, perfectly filmed, and how the sound just disappears as the man falls. It gives me goosebumps every time I see it. And then the whole sequence ends with a brilliant dive after a plane over a cliff. I mean, it's a pair of stunts that provide a great pair of bookends to the main body of the action, as well as a bit of clear escalation, like did that bungee jump take your breath away, well here it is again, without the bungee. How's that breathing going for you now? Now, this is not to take away anything from the brilliant effects work during the sequence, but the fact that there are some more obvious special effects at play as Bond flies down and gets into the plane, it kind of lacks some of the awe you have when you're seeing something like the opening bungee jump. Like, that is my preferred stunt of the two. But hey, I'm not expecting them to throw a poor stuntman off a cliff without any security after an empty plane amongst rocky mountains. For real, I just think that the bungee jump slightly apes the plane dive stunt for spectacle. Still, this is a ridiculous quibble that I'm even bringing up because I love this whole sequence, it's wonderful and a glorious opening to my favourite Bond film. Definitely one of the more iconic ones here and certainly the one that set the tone for what an audience would come to expect from these teasers. Goldfinger opens with Bond at the tail end of a previous mission before we see him become entangled with the main story. Just the idea to open the film in such a way was such a genius move, it would be nowhere near as impactful if the thing opened with Bond getting a massage on Miami Beach. Like, this is like a great hits of everything that Bond is known for, and hell, this was only the third film in the series, but there's action, humour, gadgets, spectacles, stealth, sexiness, style, and all in around about six minutes, I think the director Guy Hamilton best sums up the mission statement of a Bond pre-credit sequence with this. It seemed to me that if we could do the pre-credit sequence, uh, which is a wonderful piece of nonsense, I mean, where you can go swimming with a seagull on top of your head and you can unzip your suit and have a white tuxedo underneath. If that makes you laugh, let's all now, after the credit titles, go for a great big ride and have fun. And they certainly achieved that with this. It's a standard that all following Bond pre-title sequences would be judged by. It is indeed the granddaddy of the Bond pre-title sequence. And here we have another Bond's third go in the tuxedo, and my favourite of the Craig era pre-titles, Skyfall. I love this one for its building sense of escalation from cars to bikes to bikes on roofs to a train to a digger on a train. This is a really inventive action sequence, and how it moves from one thing to the next so seamlessly is really a wonder to behold. It's saying a lot for how well this is made that I don't even mind that it culminates with a fight on a train in a sequence more than a little reminiscent of something from Roger Moore's Octopussy. Uh, the climax is obviously a more sombre one too as the scene revives something else from an older Bond film and presumably ends with the death of 007. But it is a really impactful opening and sets the stage for both the plot and the character drama that will follow through the rest of the film. One of my very favourites, love it every time I see it. I feel like having this one so high might be a bit of a controversial selection. I have heard many a criticism centred around the fact that, yeah, some of the action is perhaps a bit more generic than you might want from a Bond film, and yes, it is super cheesy in places. What the hell is he doing? His job. 
But who doesn't love eating a bit of cheese every once in a while? I can totally see how to some people this is to them what Quantum of Solace, the opening of Quantum of Solace is to me. It's an all-purpose action sequence that you could slot any old charismatic cinematic hero into, but I'll be damned if seeing this sequence doesn't pump me up like a shark inflating pellet would. I mean, I adore this whole scene, and it's such a kick-ass bit of action to start the adventure. Pierce looks so damn good in this. He has a confidence of performance right off the bat that was perhaps understandably lacking a bit in GoldenEye, with that one being his first Bond film after all. Now, he's over the nerves, he's over the second guessing, and he's just running with it looking badass debonair while he does. The David Arnold score is just superb too. I mean, it really carries you through the whole sequence. Bond theme blaring, there's good bits of humour throughout. It technically does a little bit of plot setup regarding the GPS encoder, but honestly, there's so much else going on, it wouldn't surprise me if people missed that element completely. It really does start the film on a huge scale too. I mean, there was a time that the films would end with Bond averting nuclear disaster, never mind starting with it. A brilliant mini-adventure to start Pierce's second outing as Bond. Moonraker's pre-title contains one of my favourite stunt sequences in all of Bond. I've raved about this in many a video, but the whole free fall stuff is just superb and wonderfully photographed. It's just a marvel that they were able to pull this off at all. They had to develop a new camera out of old material, light enough for the cameraman to use so that he wouldn't break his neck when he pulled his parachute. It's just crazy. It's such a fun mini-adventure and having Jaws here is great too. The plot intrigue that opens up the film is nice, seeing a space shuttle hijacked in mid-air and Money Penny sets up one of my favourite cuts in all of cinema. Money Penny! Is 007 back from that African job? He's on his last leg, sir. Like, that to me is better than the transition from the bone to the spaceship in 2001 A Space Odyssey. I just love that moment. But obviously, it's the freefall stuff that gets all the attention, and rightly so. Yes, in this day and age, you can see the stunt people wearing skydiving equipment. They didn't actually send a parachuteless man plummeting to the ground for this. Though, if Tom Cruise was around when this scene was being filmed, he might have been game. But um, even if you notice those things, I don't think it can take away from the sheer spectacle of this. And it's such a huge testament to the skilled craftsmanship that goes into making these films. And we stay with Roger for the next sequence on this list. This one from Octopussy, which just wonderfully typifies exactly what people think of when they think of Bond pre-titles. I mean, these things do have a reputation for being completely unrelated to the main bodies of their respective films, and yet when you really consider it, it's not ever the case. I mean, even in Goldfinger and Thunderball, the pre-titles are what facilitates Bond being in the locations that he's in when we pick up with him after the credits. Octopussy, though, is probably the most detached from the main body of the film. Let me know in the comments if you think otherwise. Uh, it's a cracking sequence though. Bond is in disguise, doing some stealthy infiltrating before being captured and then flying a tiny jet plane out of a horse's ass. Obviously the Acrostar mini jet is the standout from this scene and all the shots of it flying around are terrific. Going into the hangar is wonderful. This works so perfectly as a little self-contained mini adventure. But there are still two more pre-titles that I just like a little bit more. Up until it was usurped by No Time To Die, this, from The World Is Not Enough, was the longest pre-title sequence of the series history, and indeed, according to director Michael Apted, it was never really supposed to be this way. I had a big problem um, with the opening of the movie, and it became clear the problem when I first previewed it. And the way the film was originally structured, the Bilbao scene, that was originally the pre-title sequence. When I previewed the film, the Bilbao scene really just didn't cut it. People thought, what? That's the opening of a Bond film. So I knew I'd made a mistake. And so what I knew was also that that Thames chase was a really fabulous scene. And so I then had to do some quick thinking because I decided to make that whole sequence, Bilbao and the Thames chase, the beginning of the film, the pre-title of the film, so that when Pierce falls on the Millennium Dome, then you cut to the titles. However, his story does conflict with an earlier version of the script that I've got on file. In this version, the Thames chase, in this concept with Bond in a jetpack rather than a boat, the credits do indeed play at the end of the sequence. So uh, maybe this was changed up in the first edit, but then after seeing test screenings, they had to revert back to what was originally planned? Or maybe this script is not actually reflective of what they were actually working with. Maybe it was edited after the fact. I don't know, it says for educational purposes on it. I don't know, uh, but whatever the reason for it coming to be, it it's very much a sequence of two halves, with Bond first interrogating a Swiss banker in Spain, followed by a bit of action and a relatively show-stopping stunt 
as he leaps out of a window with a homemade bungee. If this indeed had been the big moment of the sequence, the big stunt, this <laughs> entire sequence would probably have been much further down this list, I have to admit, because the thing that really makes it stand out is, of course, the chase along the Thames in the Q-boat. Sandwiched in the middle of the sequence, though, is a brief MI6 scene. Now, this is something that makes me think that this was indeed only supposed to come after the opening title sequence, because the action sequence that followed would have been a much greater surprise Prize if we had already had the opening titles by this point. I mean, you'd have been lulled into thinking, oh, here we are, the usual briefing scene, nothing to get the pulse racing here unless Bond and M get into a Scotch versus Bourbon debate, and then bam, the rug is pulled when the action kicks off. But now, because this scene is a part of the pre-titles, you're still anticipating some action to come, because by this point, we're absolutely conditioned to it, and it'd be a bit of a damp squib of an end to just have Bond say, right you are, M, off to Azerbaijan I go, and leave the office and then, you know, we play the titles. Anyway, the attack on MI6 is all kinds of exciting and Bond jumping into the Q-boat and racing down the Thames is excellent. The fact that Brosnan himself is actually doing a bunch of this is incredible. How he doesn't have lifelong dysentery from inhaling all those gallons of Thames water during this filming, I will never know. There are Bond moments galore scattered through the sequence. It's a hell of a way to begin the film, with the stakes elevated to places that they'd never been before with the attack on MI6. It has world-class action, stunts, humour, music, everything that you could want, and yet, there is just one more sequence that tips over the edge for me for pure iconography. Insert, nobody does it better pun here. Yes, how could it be anything other than the spy who loved me at the top of this list? The pitch perfect pre-title sequence. It sets up a good bit of plot intrigue before cutting to Bond halfway through and, uh, uh, an, an adventure. Uh, it spirals into an escalating action sequence, culminating in one of the very best, more iconic stunts of the entire series. It gets the balance between all the desirable elements of a Bond pre-title just right. It's textbook, scientifically proven almost. It's a perfect little sequence by itself, but the way it totally galvanizes you, gets you so excited for what is about to come, is masterful. It has scale, humor, sex. It's just a hugely fun experience. I think the plot intrigue elements are also exceptionally well handled here. The scenes on the submarine are terrific, and then introducing us to characters like General Gogol and Agent Triple X up front is a bold choice for such major characters to be introduced so soon, and then it does the rounds of the Admiralty and MI6, but not only does it all provide a good hook for the plot as we question how well these characters are going to become embroiled in Bond's world, it builds up a good bit of anticipation for the hero's eventual reveal, and the ski action is just a phenomenal payoff. It's a sequence that makes a statement. It tells you exactly what the film is going to be in under 10 minutes. It invites you to be interested and entertained better than any other pre-title sequence in this series to my mind, which is why it was something of an obvious choice for the very top of this list. Nothing can beat Bond skiing over a ledge, pulling a parachute, Union Jack emerging, Bond theme playing. It's just perfect. But was it a top choice for you? Please do let me know your own ranking of these sequences in the comments section below, or if that's a little bit too daunting, give me a top five. And also below, you can click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell oh, notification button. Stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. And as well as those buttons, there's also links below to my various social media pages, including my Twitter page, my Instagram page, my Facebook page, my Letterboxd page, and my Patreon page, for those of you who want to go one extra step in supporting this channel. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.